Okay. Ready or not, here we come. And remember, this is a working session as well as a presentation. It's our favorite kind of presentation. It's not final uh, until uh, 11.50. So please, learn from each other, continue to make revisions as we go along. Uh, strengthen your proposals, strengthen your evidence, and help each other out uh, because uh, the UN and the world is counting on us. Questions? Thank you to Olivia for uh, empowering the uh, teacher to help get the tools to improve the learning experience for all of us. That said, any, any calamities that occur in the use of these tools are my own fault, and I apologize in advance, okay? Let's see how it goes. Okay, who's first? Oh, look, Justin and Jared. Jared. Oh, hey, two of us. Okay. And Olivia, are you in the, you're all by yourself? Okay. So how do we go about this now? So now you got, you both collectively, uh, we could be one voice or the other, or you could uh, say it in unison <laughs> if you prefer. Uh, you make your proposal. And then you support your pitch with your evidence and the way you narrate your evidence. Okay? Yeah. Thank you for going first. Yeah, no problem. So our, our pitch is uh, taken from the City Beautiful Movement. We can implement multiple smaller centralized green spaces within wide boulevards to help organize cities without having to demolish existing cityscapes. So uh, <coughs> the use of uh, large central open green spaces center of cities surrounded by well-designed urban buildings that enhances the urban environment and influences the design of the city. Uh, and then you have like wide boulevards that come from the central green space that kind of carries this idea of like a, like the organization of the, the area and like the, the architecture of the area throughout the rest of the city. And then to help like further this, they have uh, limited building heights surrounding the central green spaces and only monumental buildings or core buildings are left at higher heights to kind of make that very center the city. So then like using these ideas but at a smaller scale, you can like start to have like these central green spaces connect to the boulevards that already exist in cities and kind of transform cities that are lacking with this organization without having to completely bulldoze them or redesign them. Okay. That's great. And to further support that proposal. Yes. So I just said that the National Mall and uh, Washington DC acts as like a large public central green space for the city and provides organization through its monumentality as well as its use of government structures, museums, and memorials. So the first overlay is gonna call out the roads that run like parallel with the mall. Um, and then the next uh, uh, highlight is like the diagonal ones that have like these like axes from the surrounding city that go towards the Capitol building. And then the Capitol building and the monument kind of make up like um, the National Mall proper and provide like a really like dominant like um, purpose within the city. And then that blue highlight is like the museums and other significant buildings that actually find themselves like within the mall itself to help like um, bring like, like include like the public realm into the area. So what do you guys think? Is that a convincing proposal? Just to remind you what the proposal is. It's to, uh, take the lessons of the City Beautiful and implement it uh, on a smaller scale without having to demolish yeah. existing. Well, you could probably demolish some things, but not as much as you would take like in DC, like making a huge squall, like sprawling green space at the, the center, mm -hmm. having just multiple like heavy centers. So, I would say um, the analysis goes with this because Washington DC was designed to like have that so there wasn't any demolishing of previous structures. Like that was from the get go like an original plan. So at least the proposal aligns with the statement. Well, um, I think part of what you're observing, which is absolutely correct, 
is that the evidence is of a case where L'Enfant laid it out uh, originally before anything was built when it was empty land, it was swamps. And uh, there wasn't any demolition needed for the first iteration. But the second and third iterations required the removal of things that didn't comply. So there was significant, especially in the most recent one, the Macmillan, was it Macmillan or the more uh, the Federal Triangle, there were demolitions required in those subsequent things. But maybe uh, a friendly amendment from uh, your colleagues might suggest um, maybe uh, substituting uh, something else for wide boulevards. Because wide boulevards is the thing we saw in Houseman's Paris, right, that required demolition. What would be a, a good uh, adjustment to this text? And I think you can edit it, but it won't yeah. show up. Yeah, try editing. Try editing now to see what happens. What would be a good substitute if the goal is to avoid demolition? What should this wood friendly amendment can you offer? I suspect you're going to have colleagues mentioning that. Um, but if, let's say I have a town, let's say our town here in Boston, where we have the opportunity, like here's one, I'm looking at one, there's the pike, right? What if it's not a straight line? Should we demolish things to straighten the lines, or should we just take advantage of the meandering path, for example. Is that okay if it's not a visual corridor? Should we soften our, our formalist approach to allow other, to explore other possibilities in cities? Or is it, or how important is it to have the visual corridor as part of the city beautiful phenomenon? I feel like it depends on the city, though, too. Like, I feel like in D.C. specifically it's important because of, like, those, like, where was that? The Pennsylvania and Maryland avenues that like they have they almost use the Capitol building like as a perspective, like when you're entering the mall. Yeah. It's like a perspective idea. Yeah. So I feel like in situations like DC where there's like a monumentality in place, that's mm -hmm. kind of pretty important. Yeah, well I mean that's part of the DNA of City Beautiful. It's the whole point is to yeah. give human scale experience down these visual corridors from miles away you see the Capitol building. But uh, if you go out uh, Annex North and you see this triangular geometry embedded in the concrete, uh, that is the result of a campus design studio in 2009 that proposed uh, connecting Ruggles Station with Longwood Medical through the campus. And um, the, the designers, the master plan firm were the, were the critics for the studio and they were influenced by the work of the students to suggest that potentially there should be a straight line visual connection between Ruggles Station and Longwood Medical cutting through the campus uh, when there was a tennis court here. So that got embedded in the concrete as a potential future straight line, but it would have required the demolition of, uh, it would have required a lot of demolition between the sewage treatment plant and the dorm across the street to create that straight line visual corridor, not to mention the complete redevelopment of Alice Hayward Taylor Public Housing, which was part of the proposal of the studio. Uh, but that's an awful lot to get a straight line visual corridor. Is it okay to, to create a meander and maybe the proposal, if the goal, if the criticism of the history since uh, or the criticism of City Beautiful is that it requires so much demolition that it becomes uh, either on purpose or not on purpose, it becomes 
an instrument of dislocation of populations, what would be a friendlier approach that doesn't require the visual corridor or we, we can't negotiate away the visual corridor? It depends on what you guys want to support. So probably something to do with like existing infrastructure. So like putting the, the green spaces strategically in places that will really kind of inherently give it that characteristic. To the extent possible or, extent possible, yeah, or weighing the needs of the community. Yeah. So where possible, create visual corridors might be. But I think wide boulevards, is that, how important are wide boulevards? Maybe it doesn't have to be wide. Yeah, maybe it's a human scale street. So, is that, do you guys agree to that? So one of the things we should be learning, one of the skills we should be learning, one of the 21st century skills. In the 20th century, um, if you want to help change the world, step one, be a wealthy white male. Step two, see how I skipped right over that? <laughs> step two, take power. Step three, impose your will upon the unwitting masses of the world. That's, uh, that's how we got the 20th century. That's how the 20th century solutions became the most serious problems of the 21st century. If we want to continue and worsen those problems, let's keep doing that. If we want to effectively address those problems, which I'm assuming we do, do the opposite of that. So one of the crucial techniques that has emerged out of urban planning uh, discussions since the 60s is the idea of consensus. Consensus planning is one of the most powerful tools to emerge out of the 20th century and offer a potential solution for the 21st century. Now, the way consensus planning was done in the 20th century, or attempted in the 20th century, was fill a, a high school gym with shouting people. Do breakout groups and have little tables, and then come back together and shout at each other. It worked not so well, um, but it was a start. But now we have the internet, and one of the most promising tools uh, that came out of the 1960s is called single document consensus. And so in the 60s, we used this thing we had, it was called paper and someone would start the process by writing a proposal similar to this right they would write a proposal and then they would put the paper on the wall and then other people could read it they could comment on it and they could change it how cool is that paper was an extremely powerful technology uh, for single document consensus but what is a more powerful tool for single document consensus? It hasn't changed. Do I have to reload it? Okay. Did someone say the internet? The internet. Yes. Thank you. I agree. I think the internet is got a I don't I think it's I think it's catching on. I think uh, it's going to be around for a while, and I think it might help us. Because who can edit this statement? Anyone. Anyone in this room can edit this statement. So this is an extremely powerful form of the single document consensus. Uh, raise your hand if you agree with this statement as written. Raise your hand if you don't agree with this statement as written. It should be everyone. OK, everybody raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand. Yeah, everyone raise their hand. OK. 
Well done. Ah! Well, what part, wait, what part you have to raise your hand. <laughs> now, <laughs> if you agree with this as written, If you agree, are you with us or not, Olivia? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. If you, I hope so. David, this machine doesn't go forward unless all hands are raised. Everybody raise your hand. If you agree with this statement as written, put your hand down. Oh, you just want to put your hand down. I'm throwing this eraser at anyone. You guys are so full of it. But, so, in a, I, I guess I have to speak in hypotheticals, but I want this to be the way we operate, right? Because this is a set of skills that you can bring to your careers and your colleagues will say, wow, where did you go to school? How did you get that, right? This is a powerful tool. If you don't agree with this, then you can object to it. And if one person objects to it, it's not done yet, right? That's what the word consensus means. If one person says no, then the answer is no. Who, who, who does that terrify? Isn't that a terrifying thing to turn over complete power for moving forward? Like what if I could not speak until everyone raised their hand? Right? That would slow things down. Like David would would not allow anything to move forward. Right? So um, here's the thing. In current I don't know if you've noticed this, I don't know if any of you have ever voted or listened to the news. But in the United States, for those of us who have listened to the news and have voted, we notice that you don't have to convince everyone in the room. You only have to convince half of the people in the room plus one. And that means that, uh, and one of the really effective strategies for, for winning half plus one <coughs> is to ridicule, insult, uh, accuse, falsely accuse, anyone who you can identify as a potential minority voice. If you, if you think, you know, if David uh, is holding up things, you can just s spread lies about him, insult him, call him names, and convince half people plus one, uh, then you're all good, right? So democracy, who thinks democracy is a good thing? It's pretty, yeah. It's, uh, some would say it's the worst possible system except for all of the others, right? Which is another way of saying it's the best thing we've got. But um, majority rules democracy has proven to be extremely corrosive and destructive and harmful. And that's why consensus democracy has been put forward as a better model. Now, with great power comes, what is it? Great responsibility. Great responsibility, thank you, Spider-Man. Um, and so, if you are the sole voice objecting in a consensus decision, that means you broke it, you own it. You have to fix it. So. If you don't agree with this statement, you have to propose uh, language that, and this is key, this is crucial. This is crucial, Justin and Jared. You not only have to propose a change that you will allow you to agree to it, but that everyone else is likely to agree to. That's hard. 
So that if I'm not going to object to this unless I can think of something better that I think everyone can agree to. Okay? So do you guys have a suggestion to make this better that every, you think everyone can agree to? Why don't you guys read it out loud? Sure. Taking from the city beautiful movement, we can implement multiple smaller green spaces connected with existing streets to help organize cities without having to bulldoze existing elements, all while creating visual corridors when possible. Okay. Anyone object to that? Do we have consensus on this statement? Please raise your hand if you do not consent to this statement, which suggests that you have an improvement to offer. And it's no big deal, right? If you have an improvement to offer, we won't get mad at you. We'll actually say thank you very much. Seeing no objections, we consent to this. Oh. I like when you say smaller green spaces, do you mean like parks or do you mean just like sidewalk, like sidewalk gardens or like no, de definitely like parks, like pretty much equivalent to what is being done in DC, like in the analysis, but at a smaller scale. So not at a smaller yeah. scale where it's like sidewalks, but that's like not impactful. But a big enough scale where like it's a natural like center of some sort, just multiple centers as opposed to one guy. How about trees along the streets? Like a tree canopy. I mean, I'm not against that, but I don't think that's exactly what we're proposing, right? But it's inclusive. So yeah. green space would be a larger category, mm -hmm. and smaller green spaces would be inclusive of any of anything like this. Yeah. Right. So, do you have an improvement to propose, or do you consent? Can you abstain in consensus? In consensus, there is no abstention. You either consent or you do not consent, or you object. Yes. It may work for the planned out urban zones, but what about the current case? Like, as an example. Caracas? Like, improper settlements. So, like, they don't have the proper roads. If you want to make a Corridor B here. You need to build those a lot of houses on the way. Yeah. Well, I think the what we were talking about earlier is that we don't really like we're at a point now where obviously bulldozing communities isn't going to help, but and, like implementing these green areas is going to help more than it would not at all. So like just implementing them and having them be the best case scenario, like when possible, is the best way to go about it instead of just trying to make everything perfect every time. It's probably not going to work. Does that satisfy your concern? Do you consent to the statement? I would say yes for now. Okay. Uh, do you consent to this statement? Any objections? Z. Um, it's not really a, like an objection. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 he's no, going to no. make it better. <laughs> I'm being so serious, because like, you can implement green spaces and nobody could touch them. It doesn't do anything for like, you know, it doesn't do anything for like what you're really trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of like, I think what the, I think the goal is like more redeveloping, like, um, more, like more, in like more, less, like basically like re taking, lesser used areas and not turning them like into greenways or whatever, but like using them and like making them, like for example, like the video analysis that I did had like a really good example of it. Like they took um they took like an old trainway and they made it into like a bicycle and pathway that and it runs in between like two streets, like two main streets along like a, along Sounds like you're joining this group. Which group? This group? Yeah. Kind of. With your people. evidence. What? With your evidence in hand. You join them, you bring your evidence and you just so we, maybe we do that. I feel like all these, all three of us were kind of. No, no, this is productive. This is a new coalition formation. So do you guys have evidence that also connects with? Mine's just like them. Okay. I was just going to hop off of what Z was saying. Let's let's structure this. Let's have you guys present your evidence next. Okay? Okay. <laughs> um, what I was going to 
gonna say is maybe like instead of saying green spaces. Actually not mine. Is this it? So Z, where's yours? Uh it's like I think uh if you go the you see the middle two right there? Yeah. It's Isa. Uh, yeah, it's yes. Number, it's number 20. Oh, it is. Okay, so 20, so 20, 21, and 22. Yeah. Olivia, can I uh, select multiple? So I'm going to move 20 to position 3. Olivia, I think Prezi should be able to do this better than it's doing it, don't you think? Okay, so we've changed the sequence. It's not letting me start at the beginning, which is disappointing. <laughs> what do you click when you start it? Because mine goes from the beginning. It does? Yeah. How'd you do that? Okay, let me try that. Thank you. Okay, is this is this your evidence? Yeah. So your proposal is Revising your own action plan? Yeah, to a degree. Well, kind of. Yeah, so well, I mean, like, not really, because like the automobile, like, its prominence in like modern society is like it, it is where it is, and like it, the automobile is like kind of inevitable to like technology, like so you know, like removing it, like, is not going to be like the most easiest thing in the world. Even changing to like, because like people are, like moving from like gas cars to electric cars, that's still like a car staying there. So like it's a matter of like. Um, um, I think it's like redeveloping how we can. So what was the other point? But like um, being able to like implement like just as uh, just as effective like pedestrian roadways as they are like um, yeah. on, on the so, um, so Isa, what do you think? I mean, you should kind of be sitting next to Z, right? So you two can consult on the the improvement of this statement. Is this statement ready for us to consent to, Z and Isa? No. Do you have some improvements to make? So why don't you work on improvements in the background and we'll move on uh, to uh, Tamara and Xavier. Are you guys together? I was in there, but then when they started to present, I moved with them. Okay. I was also talking Yeah. We're trying to get where 
I was. I was analyzing the more of the ratings. So those of you who are part of this discussion, are you in the back of the room because you're in favor of free market, free choice? Uh, as a mechanism for achieving this? Or it sounds an awful lot like there's public-private partnership at the very least. I think it's more private. It's more private? Because we're talking about street infrastructure. We're not, are you proposing that we privatize the streets and roads and networks? No. And then change them? Then I think, I suggest that those of you who are working on this should come up and work with these guys uh, and alter the sequence because I seem incapable of doing it. You guys take over. Olivia, yep. I, I uh, invite you to help fix the sequence of materials. It should go statement, evidence, 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 statement, evidence, 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 okay? And in the meantime, I want to move to a whole other part of the discussion. Okay? And remember, this is a working session. Uh, this is necessary work in order to come up with the best action plan that we can come up with. So this is you, Isa? Or Tamara? Who's this? I noticed that my things somewhere there, so I moved myself to there, but I didn't move my physical self to there. Okay, physically move yourself there. And this is also part of the same group. Who's this? Okay, clump with these guys and fix it. And who's this? Olivia, you're out on your own? Yep. Okay, why don't you present your position? Yes. So while the client has room for all of this green space and like outdoor playing areas such as baseball fields, um, so it has that quality of suburban life and it also has all of these really big single family houses. And some multifamily. Yeah, that are connected by curvy roads and have large spaces between them. So mm -hmm. like one of the differences is how much space this takes up in footprint versus the city, which is another privilege of living in the suburbs is the amount of space you have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like the best of both worlds because you can see the proximity of Boston. And so what is your action item statement based on that? Is there a way we can do both? Because we're here in the 21st century, I don't know if you know this about us, we don't like either or. We like both and. But we, were, we grew up, we were born between 1995 and 2005, and we're just not used to having people say no to us. That makes us a bit more brazen in asking and expecting more from the world than previous generations. And so far, let's see if we can make that a good thing. Let's challenge ourselves to, do, to get it to work the way we want it to work. How do you want it to work, Olivia? Do you want uh, the, the one wealthiest 1% 1 to have extreme privilege uh, in sharp distinction with uh, the lowest 80%? No, that's why I'm saying that you should, like, more transitional spaces like this should be implemented in order to not have such a stark contrast. So this is a transitional space? I believe What's the uh, evidence of transition? from the 
city to provide that it's not all multifamily homes. Yeah, there's kind of a, a gradation. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying is that it's point at that evidence and tell us what your interpretation of that is. Them bringing the multifamily homes into the line. That's like an example of them transitioning already and being able to bring like somebody who maybe can't afford a single family home in Brookline to the point where they can afford like a portion of a multifamily home in Brookline. So it's bridging them together but through the architecture. So and I see what you're saying. And there's a, a lack of segregation between the 1% and the 19%. Yeah. And then is there evidence of 19% going, what's that? I am pretty sure that's Brookline High School. No. Brookline High School is over in Brookline Village. So that would be interesting. I wonder if that's, that could be public housing. How awesome would it be if that were public housing? This is multifamily dwellings. Uh, what does PUD stand for? PUD. Private. User development. New urban. De I don't know. Dwelling. Private. <laughs> Can't remember my acronym. Busting. It's a PUD. It looks a lot like a school. There's Lars oh, Anderson. It's, it's Dexter Southfield School. That's Dexter it's Southfield school. school. Is there any public housing there in this public. image? It's all the way in the back. It's only close oh. to the city. What's the closest public housing? Because Brookline has multifamily dwellings, has apartment buildings. It also has public housing, I think. Yeah, isn't it that way though? Like but yeah. Yeah, it's like off screen to the left. <clears throat> but that's the evidence we're looking for that would really support this idea that you can have high quality urban landscapes, suburban landscapes that are accessible not just to the wealthiest and not just to the uh, 19%, but to everybody, right? So we're looking for the evidence that would allow those words to come out of our mouths and allow us to not compromise, not give up. Like you're over there on the hope side. So uh, what we're looking from you, Olivia, is leadership in convincing us that is, it is within our reach in this generation between now and peak human to make the amenities of Lars Anderson Park readily accessible to everyone. That's your job. Good luck. We're coming in. And is anyone joining Olivia over here? It's not just that there's an outlet for the... I think Olivia should join us. She's dealing with a different... Uh, don't be so greedy. You're, you're doing city beautiful at a human scale. That's challenging enough. Let Olivia work on uh, urban form of housing. In, in, uh, in close proximity to really incredible benefits, amen urban amenities, that is Lars Anderson Park. Who's been ice skating in Lars Anderson Park? Oh, you should, I, oh, oh. Oh, Ross, but the, so Brookline public housing is basically like on the border of Brookline, but really it's just in Longwood. It's in where? So it actually, it's like in Longwood. It's just right on the border of Brookline, so it actually kind of shows how they're not as transitional. Because they've sh taken the public housing and shoved it like to their furthest border that borders the larger city. Yeah, and we're working on that. The state of Massachusetts has a 41D legislation. If your community, Brookline, are you paying attention, Brookline? If your community does not have sufficient housing for uh, to uh, cover the affordability requirement as defined in the law, we, the state of Ma the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, will, and the state has done this, we will come in and we will override any planning and zoning restrictions on multifamily development 
and allow developers to develop affordable housing as of right, including uh, high rise, uh, high density dwellings that you, the city of Brookline, has no, uh, no option to block, no legal authority to block it, unless and until you meet your affordability share. This is an extremely progressive, extremely powerful law that has the 101 towns and municipalities of the greater Boston area trembling in their boots and scrambling to fulfill the requirement of affordability. So your proposal, this is the mechanism to fulfill your proposal. It's not perfect. It's under threat from legal challenges. Uh, it's moving all the time every year. I'm not totally up to date. But it wouldn't be crazy for you to tackle this as a career path and help towns and municipalities achieve uh, affordability goals and at the same time satisfy some of the things that you're showing here and that your classmates are proposing in terms of proper design of urban roadways. Okay, it's within your reach. Okay, who's this? Bradley? Yeah. Are you with anyone? Not that I know. Okay. Lay it on us. You want me to read that? I love it. it. Or an improved version of it. Either what's there or an improved version of it. All right. It is up to the private sector to fund new jobs and create transportation revolutions around and within existing cities. It is up to the people to follow these opportunities, and it is up to the government to reinforce and support the private sector as they begin our transition to combine our towns and cities. So uh, I have some questions. Um, the juxtaposition of private sector and transportation revolutions. Um, the, what are the transportation revolutions that are available to private sector actors? Uh, any of them, because most of the private sector can actually afford to, to create or innovate new public transportation. Well, Elon Musk can. Uh, because of his begill, begill, begills, I'm not sure what the proper unit of measurement is, can say, hey, peasants, I am willing to fund the drilling of, of tunnels across the United States for uh, trains at multiple times the speed of sound. You're welcome. Right. So that is an example of exactly what I'm challenging you to come up with. But other than him, I, let's say I'm a gazillionaire, just a gazillionaire. And I say, hey, Boston, I'm going to bestow upon you, because of, I'm, I'm a nice guy, uh, a new uh, urban ring, uh, inner uh, light rail. I'm just going to build it for you. Can I do that as a private citizen? No, but that's where the government is taking its role in supporting and reinforcing right. the private sector. Okay. And what are the most likely private sector uh, impacts on transportation? Um, Say it louder. The automobile. The automobile. That's what the private sector has and is doing, automobile. And who else talks that way? Politicians. 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 Rich white men. Rich white men. That's what it is. And what are we studying to become? 
There's a, there's a long time honored tradition of architects coming in and architects explaining to the local communities exactly how we, it is we're going to save them. When I showed up in Sumatra after the tsunami, the head of public works said, oh my god, not another architect. And I said, don't worry, I'm also a planner. And he said, okay. And he put his arm around me and we became best friends. Um, but he shared with me all of his uh, traumatic experiences with all these architects coming from all over the world saying, I have this great prefabricated triangular modular fiberglass panel system that your people are going to, I will save your society from the ravages of the tsunami. Uh, just l Everybody just has to live in these geodesic prefabricated fiberglass. And the appropriate response is, go away. <laughs> but he was very polite, and so he gave some land to these architects. And they showed up, and he said, build us one right there. And so he created this bizarre little village of prefabricated modular uh, fiberglass panel concrete systems. And, um, and the few that leaked through, a few firms, they had billions of dollars that they had to spend or else lose it. And so they built hundreds and hundreds of houses. And the, the villagers, when I went back, the villagers use those houses. They're very grateful for those houses because they make excellent places to store their farm equipment. And their cattle and their pigs are very happy in those houses. Uh, but they don't live. Nobody lives in these houses. They are inappropriate. Uh, it was organ rejection. OK, so what's your evidence? <laughs> This is Tyson Corner, Virginia. Uh, it's actually like an expanding city. Uh, they just created the Silver Line, which is a railway system that goes through the city. And they have perpendicular um, like streets or parallel streets that go along with it. They also have parking alongside these main roads and the highways so that you can get onto the Silver Line or you could commute. And then the highway system actually goes uh, to the sides of the, the city so that it's not creating conditions in the city. And all of the housing and like has kind of built itself around the city, around the jobs, and the city itself is actually continuing to grow. They're making more and more buildings every year in the city. So um, connect this evidence with your proposal. So what I'm saying, and this is another uh, view from above it, is that if we were to create electrical transportation systems that connected the, uh, the towns outside of the cities with the inner cities, more people would be able to commute and like actually get to jobs. And so electric them. train systems? Electric train systems or systems like this one. What, is this an electric train system? I believe so, yeah. Is this an extension of the heavy rail uh, system in Washington, D.C., the metro system? Um, I actually, yeah, it is. It's the metro system from Washington, D.C. So that's public-private partnership. Uh, that um, Tyson's Corner is a new town. It was designed from scratch in the farm fields, and uh, it was developed. Um, it's interesting to note the the architectural urban arrangement where housing is here uh, and there's a parking lot and a train station. Um, I wonder how many people get in their cars, drive here, park, and then get on the train um, because there's no sidewalk here. You know, it's an interesting thing. So where a lot of these things go wrong uh, are the, the public part of the public-private partnership. So I would challenge you to come up with some way to um, get these multiple players to collaborate more effectively. Like how do you get, like, is there a, a scenario by which the private sector would say, here's the deal, we'll make you a deal. We will uh, invest in a new private 
public development at this train station with high-rise housing and commercial mixed use and shopping if you promise you the local municipality you promise to complete the infrastructure so there are sidewalks and trees and connecting with uh, this proposal the city beautiful proposal uh, and you the municipal the greater the metropolitan district uh, transit Authority, if you increase the frequency of your trains, will do this. So does that alter, does that, does that allow you to make your proposal more specific? Yeah. And is anyone wanting to join? Do you see an opportunity to join with Brad? No, I, I can add on to it though. Well, you guys have a complimentary no, thing going on. Like okay, yeah, because go like ahead. In terms of like speaking private sector and the public sector can work together. I know in Tokyo, we talked about this last class, their rail system, mm -hmm. it's like six or seven different independent rail companies that are all private, but the government just works to organize them all. So yeah. that might be what kind of what he's touching on, like having private industry do what it needs to do, but there's just one like overlying public industry that just organizes them. So the, the government's not making the trains, but they're organizing the trains and placing the stations. Yeah. So what group believes that they should go next? that they can connect with this. And, uh, well, let's see who is next, and we'll see what happens. Who's this? Mike, okay. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. All right, so with the urban condition growing at a large rate, we must be able to implement public spaces in order to advocate for pedestrian activity and the importance of the individual. So fast. Pace with the urban condition, urban populations, urban density. Sure, yes. I wish the board could actually. We're not there yet. With the urban density growing at a fast pace, we must be able to implement public place spaces in order to advocate for pedestrian activity and the importance of the individual. Is that an action proposal? What do you really want us to do? Like prioritizing implementing public spaces. So think about that question. Like it, uh, I think, team, what do you think? It should be uh, something that my town can actually act on. Like I'm not sure what you're proposing. Because we have urban conditions and large rates, and we have public spaces, and we advocate for pedestrian activity, and individuals are important. So we're all set. The level of abstraction here lets me off the hook, because I can say, yeah, I agree with that, and we did it. Spike the ball in the end zone, mission accomplished, we're done. Because it's so abstract, you're not really, it's not really an action item that you can hold me as a public official accountable for. So as we go through the evidence, this is the challenge of your group. You ready? All right, so Times Square originally. So um, right now, first thing that's gonna pop up is like the highlight of the signs and everything, and it's really like focused on the pedestrian activity and everything because we're trying to advertise in Times Square and everything and bring the people out so they can see all these bright lights and, and everyone knows about Times Square. Um, and right now there's currently one street going through with a cross street as well um, that is really just for taxis and everything like that. But originally there used to be Broadway Street as well, which can be seen here. And so in 2009 they changed that and took it out and implemented. So originally they only had this public space for the pedestrian, but after taking out Broadway, which will come up, they implemented extra pedestrian areas that like allows for a higher density of people while also uh, creating a safe environment. And so due to this, by having a focus on the pedestrian, Times Square is able to provide a safe environment that brings movement and life to the city while also unifying the people. Okay, let's keep moving. So this is very specific. So this can actually help inform an improvement on the statement. So uh, I talked about the Highline Manhattan, where uh, by repurposing the old railroad 
uh, tracks that ran through the city. They took the pedestrian traffic, which was on the ground level there, and um, and pretty much added it like into the realm of the buildings uh, above ground. So taking the pedestrian activity from below and bringing it above. And in just this era of automobility, the pedestrian movement is sort of forgotten. So this is like a kind of mo uh, mo movement to focus on that more. And then these buildings that the space, the High Line enters, creates an opportunity to tighten the community by having these moments of interaction between people, like that patio on the left. And then it also gives the opportunity for people to enjoy a nice landscaped area, um, like together as a people. So I also did mine on the High Line, and I said, uh, reclaiming back parts of the city so the public can experience nature, art, and design is good for bringing the community together. The width of the trail changes in certain spots, creating different opportunities for vegetation and congregation of moments for people. Um, I think this is a good example of how residents of the community and the city help the people reclaim back part of this already dense city. Um, <coughs> and in moments where you can see like a rooftop mechanical equipment, it, um, there's vegetation that acts, acts as like foliage. Um, Sure. Um, how can residents and cities transform their neighborhoods into places built more around the people? Okay. Yeah, so I did Central Park, um, and Central Park was one of the most successful products of the City Beautiful Movement because of its ability to attract wealthy people to the city and bring their money um, with that as well. Um, and along with that, it served the residents of New York City. Um, so you see, like, that in red is, like, the where like, the wealthy people live and the property value of those buildings kind of skyrocketed once Central Park was built. Um, and Central Park was also built like along Fifth Ave and Eighth Ave. Um, so it's kind of the center of the city and it allows residents to get there easily. Um, highlighted in blue is like the kind of features of Central Park that make it kind of beautiful um, for the residents around it, so making it a safer place. And, um, and then this was relating it to a lecture out, it's kind of cleaning up the area um, and making it nicer for the people who live in the city. Okay, so a uh, kind of a, a bonus, separate project of that complements because it's the pedestrian uh, public amenities of high quality pedestrian experiences. So let's see. Is this the next group? No, it's me. There's no space for me. Okay, but I have we done this one? This is a group. Okay, let's do this group. Go ahead. And move yours into someone else's. Or do you have people around you? No. No? Mm -hmm. Can you move yours with this group? Are you with this group? Yeah. Okay, let's do yours. So you're adding your evidence? Can you come talk to them? Well, first present yours. So why don't you come into this group and help them revise <coughs> their statement to make it more impactful. Okay. Okay. Back of the room. What do you guys got? We are talking about the street planning uh, and how like, the uh, cities or the municipality 
should uh, cooperate with the community itself to for the street planning successful how successful street planning and how this should be integrated uh, after that to the urban planning goals of the city itself. So um, what should the urban planning codes do? They should... They should like relate to the community itself when they try to do a renovation of the street uh, plan. So this uh, statement, you won't be surprised to hear me say, is similar to the statement we just heard. It's, um, it's so not specific. Like the only specific thing, it, it feels like as a mayor, uh, the only thing I need to do to satisfy this action step uh, and claim victory to my constituents in time for the next election, the only thing I need to do uh, is to tailor street life to new interventions uh, as a result of dialogue between urban planners and the community and potentially a change to the, um, the planning code, which is just a tool that planning commissions and planning boards, most, in most towns, um, uh, there are zoning requirements that produce an as of right, and you've run into this in your co-ops, right? Some of the projects are being built as of right. The current regulations of the town permit the developer or the owner to build this way without going before any hearings, right? As of right. Increasingly, especially as you get closer and closer to the core of the metropolitan area of Boston, like in Brookline and in Cambridge, you can't do anything as of right. The Planning Commission interprets the rules such as such that there is no such thing as as of right. If you want to just put a dormer on your roof to bring light into your attic space, as you, yeah, you got to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Right? You have to go before the Planning Board and get special approval through a public hearing process. So those are the mechanisms, um, just so you guys know, if, in case you haven't already run into it. That's the mechanism that lies ahead in your career paths. Um, so given that, um, if those are the mechanisms, then what should we be proposing that towns and cities do? And that's what the language, it should be shorter and more specific. It should be a single sentence, and it should be very, very specific and clear. Um, and that you guys are revising yours? Yes, we do. OK. So that's the challenge as we review the evidence that, that this group faces. Take it away. Uh, I, bas I did um, Deanna Ashra. I'm basically explaining how it's like one of the base best places to live in because of its close with, with Close mixed use places in close proximities and dispersed public nodes. Also, the city, most of the city is within 30 minutes access, meaning there's no need for long commute and sitting in frustrating traffic. And implied by the even distribution of the churches, the city's designed around convenience for the residents. <laughs> On the street level and below, it's places for goods and service which connects the people. And then around the area, um, I mean, and those two are red are hotels, so they place right in the middle of the city, giving visitors access to the central location of the cities and throughout the, all the services. And then the purple of the housing, which are placed in, in the middle, giving privacy to the residents, but also giving them that close location to get service and goods. And also the streets are open enough and focus on pedestrian movement instead of vehicle movement. Okay. So uh, does this contribute to a more impactful action item? Yeah. Well, so think about that. Okay, who's this? 
this is great. So basically I did uh, Paris and how they have the visual corridors. So the first thing I highlighted was that at the end of those visual corridors are like important pieces of architecture, but in between them, they're like public gardens or uh, vegetative spaces for the human realm and specifically for human interaction. And then afterwards, there are the streets that um, cut through these sections, but the width of them are is such of less significance to the actual green space. And then flanked by these are the actual like, um, <coughs> architectural pieces that were implemented, such as the radiant, beautiful city. But the way that it is compromised, I mean, the way that it's conducted is much more for the human experience rather than like uh, a metric as like the con. So it's kind of like questioning why we use like other metrics of city planning if we're designing the human experience. So I think it's pretty clear that you should be sitting with these guys, yeah, working like with them. After seeing their analysis, I kind of like to move my video. Okay, so can you uh, sit, move your body, and move your video in the lineup? In that order. Oops. <laughs> okay, who's this? All right. Um, so the community in Akron realized that their car culture is dominating. So like the street used to take up the majority of space, but they um, pushed it over so only one lane remained, and then they had added parking and like bright colored bike lanes to draw attention to uh, using other forms of transportation. And then they added pop-up shops, street cafes, and then like games on the street to bring people outside and really utilize this new public space that they created. Um, and then, yeah, get like community interaction um, between the members. So in terms of an action plan associated with this evidence, that's specific and that is impactful. <coughs> I've seen this somewhere before. Have you seen this somewhere before? Yeah. Recent. Yeah, two point, two bonus points. So this was like San Pablo. They did like uh, there's interventions and technical urbanism tools. Uh, so they were testing new urban strategies to point out the areas in their neighborhoods where they felt safe or not safe. Uh, and they, the community uh, started to share some tools with each other to change how to change those spaces by analyze, analyzing the existing urban conditions. They started by marketing and uh, uh, marketing and painting for uh, in cones where they added roundabouts in the middle of the streets and spread extensions, widening the, the pedestrian island. These changes have helped to generalize and uh, slow turning vehicles, creating cafes and waiting areas for people uh, crossing the streets. Um, the intersection of the roundabouts was made uh, more complex for installing the uh, curb extensions, which had added benefit of creating new public space. Were you at the lecture? Yeah. Did you mention it in your argument? Mm, I don't know. But this is in Sao Paulo, not here. So That's OK. This strategy is directly out of the Better Block playbook. Mm -hmm. And just saying that earns you. OK. Right? So this is a beautiful example. So when you guys. Who's, who's ever driven? Okay. So. Right. So I don't want to. I don't want to assume. Right. So if you're, if you're, if you're on the street and you're approaching this intersection and you're going here, imagine that that's the curb. Right. How fast do you go? Thirty. Right. You go thirty. Now, here's a different geometry. Here's a different geometry. Now how fast do you go? Like 10, 15. Right. So is the difference, so what is the role of a speed limit sign and this abstraction that is the law, the legal system? If you want to, no, this is, a, this is a crucial question. If you want people to slow down, what should you do? A, change the speed limit, or B, change the shape? Change the shape. 
Oh, speed bumps are not very. Every yeah. Speed bumps. Every ten feet have a speed bump. Yeah. Speed bumps was. So who hates? Who hates speed bumps? My muffler hates speed bumps. Okay. <laughs> Is there a better way to achieve this other than speed bumps? Yes. My car hates speed bumps. So, <laughs> if we don't like speed bumps, do we like speed limit signs? No. Hate well, those are the limits. only two options, right? No. You can no. either... I've seen pictures of signs <laughs> that say that roads are enforced by missiles. So, here's, here's the other option. Back in the 20th century, where I come from, all we had was speed limits and speed bumps and nothing else. But you, you guys in the 21st century, <laughs> you got a whole bunch of other options. It turns out the design of the form of the city can is actually a much more impactful tool for controlling the behavior of the car driver. Remember the URI reading in the automobility? The car driver is a single mental entity. When I'm walking down the street, I'm like a human being. But this same human being, you put me behind the wheel and I become a car hyphen driver and my mental state is completely altered. Suddenly, I hate people and it's all about me, 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 me. And I'm, I'm worse than a car hyphen driver. I'm a car hyphen Boston driver, <laughs> right? Mass that is the worst kind of so car driver. Car hyphen mass hole. Exactly. Okay, are we on to a new group here? We did this. No, that's mine. That's yours? Yeah, that's mine. Oh, okay, but you're back. So you need to move your position. Let's, why don't you just present it? Let's see what you got, Z. What do you got? Um, so this is in Helsinki, <laughs> Finland. Okay. Um, so basically, like all those red spots. So there was a street, and like, um, like right through the street, they used to have like this big train system, like a bunch of road railways that ran through. Light um, rail. What? At grade light rail, tram, streetcars. No, it was it was it was underground. So like, oh, you okay. can see like right here, like. The railway runs underneath, and the streets like sort of cross perpendicular. I see. Yeah. Um, so basically, like since like the mid 1900s, it wasn't really used that much. Um, and then they built a new apartment complex at the, at one of the ends of the railways. Um, so then they transformed the railway from just the regular railway into like a pedestrian and bicycle uh, way that moves <coughs> from that apartment complex into the center of the town itself. And it sort of like splits the urban fabric. So as you and like as you have like these cars moving on either side, like it's accessible throughout the middle. Sort of like the the, the greenway, the Kennedy Greenway and on the north end. Should um, you be with the um, Highline group? The Highline. Who's where are the Highline people? Shouldn't you be up here? This is kind of a low line. Do you, do you belong with these people or are you belong with these people? <coughs> okay, you can, you, you can help them out. Can you help them get more specific with their proposal? So we're done? Everybody's presented? Who has a video? So which one? The two lines right there. Okay. Tomorrow. <laughs> so city planner, so present us this quickly. Go ahead. Okay, let's look at your evidence while you f ponder the question of how. You know what I would say about this. What would I say if I were going to say something about that action statement? Not specific enough. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see what we got here. I haven't yet matched up the playback speed narration, what? but this is uh, Fairview, New Jersey. It was built uh, in 1918 and was based off the Garden City concept by Ebenezer Howard. That's a horrible claim. I'm, I'm giving background information. Yeah, don't do that. What's your claim? Uh, it creates a central green space in the center of the town uh, with uh, retail spaces around it. And after that, there's rings of uh, suburban homes with uh, front backyards uh, so that everyone has their own uh, little green space as well, in addition to the public green spaces. And there's institutional spaces throughout school, churches. And this shows the public square with the retail spaces around. Which allows you to claim that the urban, the neighborhood unit continues to offer a very powerful strategy for creating high quality, uh, pedestrian friendly, human right. scale. Ex Speaking of pedestrian friendly, there's this commercial street right here, uh, plenty of uh, pedestrian space, very generous in terms of the uh, portion here with the cars, just uh, one lane going each way, trees in the center. Right? Yeah. So this is fantastic evidence to support a really powerful specific claim. Mm -hmm. Don't, uh, friends don't let friends pass up the opportunity to make such powerful claims Who's in the face buddy? of such great evidence. Who's his buddy? Kira's Kira. his buddy. Mm -hmm. Go Kira. So this is um, Chicago, Illinois. Green Belt that lines the city, creating um, a gathering space, and as well as um, a little bit more like a friendly atmosphere, and then also starts to break down some of the dense urban blocks, um, creating a little bit more ferocity. Opposed to off to the right a little bit, there is a uh, very dense um, area that. Which allows you to make the powerful claim that these green spaces are necessary for uh, uh, comfortable domestic and, yeah, yeah. Well, not domestic interaction, but like community interaction one, and then um, a comfortable like, space for, for living and like, community. So I think uh, is is what you're saying that uh, implementing public green space not simply as one-off enclosures, but as continuous fabrics that intertwine that permeate everything, is the most powerful way to connect the people of the city together. Well, because the way, the way you did this, yeah. beautifully, I might add, illust uh, demonstrates the power of green space that is not uh, walled into a park, right? <coughs> yeah, and it permeates every street, which brings us back to the thing that came up earlier. Uh, what do you mean by smaller green spaces? Do you mean parks? Well, I think what we mean is, based on this evidence, we mean green spaces at multiple scales that do more than just create isolated islands of green, but uh, create uh, a continuous interconnected urban fabric of green. Think of the emerald necklace. Has anyone not presented their video evidence? Asya, do you have something? So we got everybody? So, if you can please uh, uh, edit your action statements so we have something to present to the Secretary General. Uh, she's expecting my call uh, at noon, so um, no rush, but in the next eight minutes, if you could do that, would be great. Where are we presenting now? Now the so well organized, they'll be able to collaborate for 
I know, right? I'm so excited. And by the way, if you think it's my job to put these things in order, think again. You are all the editors. I'm just trying to facilitate the conversation. Can everyone please talk to Olivia and to Jake? Imagine you have a restraining order against Olivia. Justin and I don't speak. So, Justin, you, you work with Jake, but everybody else, <laughs> work with Olivia and Jake and help each other out in terms of setting the sequence of these things. The key is insert animation. Yeah. Will there just be one animation on every present so everybody can edit it? Well, this, yeah, there is one Prezi. It, this is a, this is, this Prezi is an extremely powerful tool for the 21st century version of the sheet of paper that used to be the only tool of single document consensus. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Okay.